mute first so our phones don't I, I don't think it, it makes a whole lot of uh, uh, difference. Uh, I, we don't have that many okay. people on. If there's any kind of a problem, we'll uh, tell you. But uh, but please, you know, ask questions and things as oh, sure. as we move along. So uh, welcome to the webinar this morning. It's going to be in two parts. It's uh, shale gas markets and and processes. Um, so it's being driven by several of our different reports. We have. Well, a number of our reports. We have one on IIoT and, and remote O&M. Uh, then we have a whole uh, database that we can quickly show you on oil and gas and profiles of all the um, uh, shale people. And then some of you on for various different uh, reasons. We have whole, whole services on on scrubbers and, and uh, nozzles, and we have them. Uh, we do a lot in uh, heat exchangers and some of the technology there and uh, we try to keep on the cutting edge of things, and as Michael Sams and I were just uh, talking here, uh, uh, he's got a, a heat pipe design, uh, heat exchanger that would take advantage of the um, clean, hot gas that could be generated by a new technology. And I would remind everybody that GE now believes that we are, because of uh, the potential for combined heat and power, that uh, whole... Um, power system in the United States could be um, reverted basically to where it was at about 1900, where all the power was local. And uh, so GE envisions a lot of, of 100 megawatt uh, power plants rather than the big 1,000 megawatt uh, power plants. And one of the potentials for all that is the uh, heat exchangers and the uh, combined heat and power. But that's a little off the subject of the shale gas markets and processes. This is a pretty exciting market. Uh, shale gas is a major worldwide opportunity and extending up to the next 50 to 100 years. And it's a game changer. Our economy right now is heavily influenced by the fact that we are becoming a uh, a uh, net exporter and the, and the largest uh, uh, producer of, of uh, oil and gas. So I think it's a lot to do with our technology to develop shale gas. Europe is not, uh, not uh, that involved because of environmental, political, and geologic considerations. Uh, shale gas in Asia is off to a slow start, uh, despite having the largest reserves. The same is true of, uh, of South America. But um, given almost any scenario, including the most conservative, the outlook for flow control and treatment is now positive as the oil and gas prices have risen throughout 2017. Flow control and treatment is required in, in record numbers to support additional pipelines, gas processing plants, LNG liquefaction plants, regas plants, and other gas uh, infrastructure. IEA predicts that the big 2018 supply story is unfolding fast in the Americas, and a return to the heady days of the first shale surge could see the U.S. leapfrog Saudi Arabia and Russia as the world's largest oil producer. Uh, and of course, the Permian Basin here uh, shown here in the, in the Texas area uh, is the largest uh, growing area and continues to grow. Obviously, oil prices are a function uh, of, uh, of oil production is a function of oil prices. And here were the, the prices here of uh, both oil at $63 a barrel and natural gas just under $3 uh, a couple uh, uh, weeks ago. But the uh, oil prices are subject to a number of factors uh, which are not all that predictable. The oil minister of Iran, which OPEC's third largest producer, says that the organization's members are not in, enticed to increase prices because they would encourage more shale production. So they have no formal target. However, they'd like to see uh, crude places prices above $60 a barrel because they're uh, going to be making a public offering for Aramco. 
So Saudi Arabia is pushing the higher prices. Uh, whether they control the other members is, is a good question. U.S. production is expected to rise above 10 million barrels a day, close to the Saudi uh, levels. And of course, this is due to the shale. So the unrest in Iran is maybe another factor. Schlumberger, Schlumberger, uh, Schlumberger expects a 15 to 20 percent increase in North American investments in 2018 and a 5% increase in international spending, which would be the first uh, growth in four years. Uh, that period saw lower spending uh, due to the slump in prices. And uh, so now what this means now is that uh, the market's now in balance and the previous oversupply discount is gradually being replaced by a market tightness premium, which makes uh, the uh, Schlumberger increasingly positive on the global outlook. So we're back to the historic, uh, you know, the prices go down, people stop drilling, then there's not enough oil and prices soar. And so, you know, we have this undulating uh, uh, market here that uh, has been historic. But the gas supply is interesting now that we have the LNG and we're shipping uh, abroad, plus coupled with the uh, increasing amount of gas that's used for power supply. So the cold winter here uh, has given a lot of concern as to whether we're going to have enough uh, gas this winter. Uh, if we could drain the nation, uh, the nation stockpiles, which are already below normal for this time of year. Uh, even so, the prices of natural gas are still well below the $6 million BTU, uh, BTU in 2014. And of course, we all remember the prices at $14 and $15 a million BTU uh, back around 2000 uh, uh, at points in time. The new pipelines, uh, for instance, uh, Trans Canada's Leach Express, uh, are going to help. Uh, and pipelines out of uh, Appalachia. But of course, this, this is a big market for combust flow and treat is all the pipelines that are needed here. So we are likely to become a net exporter of natural gas in 2018. And we're already shipping LNG to 20 foreign markets. There are a number of new LNG plants with camera and LNG will start up in 2000. 19. So these projects are transforming the Houston and Gulf Coast into a global hub of energy exports. So we will see what happens on uh, gas pricings, pricing here uh, with all these factors that uh, uh, we've just been talking about. By the way, if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to uh, make them. The shale gas market is pretty pretty well distributed around the world, and of course here in the U.S. as uh, as well. And we have a hundred year supply, uh, possibly. We have a ten year proven supply and a twenty year probable supply. And as you can see, there are a number of uh, of um, other locations around the world. Uh, the shale gas basins in China. Uh, would uh, yield more than is possible from the United States. On the other hand, the geologic uh, conditions there in China make uh, it more difficult and costly to extract the gas from shale there. And so China has embarked on a, a program that looks like it's going forward to convert about 15% of the world's coal into gas, uh, and that coal gas will be just be coming from those northern and, and northern and eastern uh, sections of China here, as you can see right in this area, and the pipeline distribution will be all over China, and that basically is a way that they see uh, low-cost comp um, competitive gas to replace solid fuels in apartment buildings and all sorts of places. Uh, where they still have a lot of uh, particulate 
emissions from small sources that could be converted to natural gas. And the reserves by country of natural gas, of course, Russia has still the largest reserves, but lots of uh, political economic problems. And, uh, and of course, we have the uh, sanctions in place as well there. So shale gas in Mexico is going to be slow to develop. There are bans on fracking in France, Germany, the UK, Sweden, and other areas there. And again, the, the European shale is are deeper than the U.S. one and a half times, and the strata is thin. So, you know, there's less there, and it's got to go deeper to get it. So that uh, is one of the problems in, 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 in Europe. Asia has the, you know, China has the world's largest reserves. Again, they're deeper and mixed with clay and rugged and in, in rugged areas. And of course, what the U.S. has done is develop all this know-how, which is lacking in most of the other areas of the world. Uh, water shortages are another problem there. And shale is starting to be developed in Australia. So there are a number of uh, factors, the, obviously the prices, water shortages, restrictive regulations. Uh, but some of these regulations are actually uh, going to be beneficial for the combust flow and treat uh, uh, markets uh, where you've got uh, oil, you've got byproduct gas, where you've got gas, you've got byproduct liquids. And what Wyoming and other uh, Western states have done is pro prohibit the flaring of the, the uh, small amounts of gas that are generated at each of the uh, oil shale uh, wells. And uh, that those have to be converted to, to liquids or to uh, a fuel that can be used for uh, engines and other uh, ways that can be used in, in nearby uh, uh, um, processes. So the delays in development of infrastructure could be critical. And of course, the weather uh, does affect it. But of course, this is uh, to be a colder than average uh, winter and does p potentially have some uh, supply constraints. Political barriers to shipment uh, to other countries have pretty much been eliminated, but that would be another a game changer. So the, uh, this I think we've already gone over in terms of the reserves. The, when you start looking at the opportunities for, for instance, monitoring compressors and valves, the Americas obviously is much bigger uh, for all your tight uh, oil and gas than the other areas of the world. The, for those particular products, the production is less of an opportunity than the transportation and the processing. And, you know, compression, refrigeration, and expansion for your uh, uh, compressors is certainly the uh, the compression being the the biggest, and then the uh, channel segmentation by where this is being sold, and the EPCs are the largest uh, uh, purchasers, and then um, in terms of the aftermarket, obviously the end users would be the the bigger markets. Now the pump market uh, biggest opportunity is production. The frac pumps are uh, uh, have a uh, a constant need for uh, wear parts and uh, represent a very big market. So let's go into some of the processes, although not in detail. We have developed for each type of uh, combustion uh, flow and monitoring equipment diagrams like this that show where uh, a particular piece of equipment would be uh, required. And so here we are, you know, looking at the uh, compressor locations. Uh, it's interesting that the compressor stations are uh, another big opportunity, but the capital requirements for new gas infrastructure will total uh, $205 billion over the next 25 years. So that's pretty substantial. The Keystone uh, pipeline is uh, Hopefully, moving forward now, uh, you know, the president, president Trump uh, cleared the way for it in March of last year, and there are still environmental uh, battles going on in various different places. But all, in uh, in order, order for us to make the most of all our reserves, we certainly have to have adequate pipeline capacity for um, 
both the oil and gas. There is uh, are a number of, uh, in fact, 17 or 13 uh, ethane crackers being built in the next four years. And Shell has got a six million, a billion dollar ethane cracker in, in Beaver County, uh, PA, to take it, take advantage of the Marcellus uh, Shale. And so this is a huge uh, project in all sorts of combust flow and uh, treat equipment. So you can see here, there's dryers and uh, scrubbers and sweeteners and and dehydrators, strippers, all these. Uh, uh, pieces of equipment in a, uh, I think, cracking uh, operation. So going back to natural gas processing generally, where you do have to take out the H2S and these other uh, pollutants and sweeten the gas, et cetera, you do have uh, all these different uh, uh, sub-processes, including the NGL recovery uh, in these uh, uh, in these operations, and the um, one of the big uh, big opportunities, uh, first of all, is to eliminate fugitive emissions to to recover uh, vapors that uh, might otherwise escape, and so that's uh, one possibility. The uh, again, the pipeline compressors that we're talking about um, do have uh, scrubbers to remove water from the gas and uh, filters to remove uh, particulate. And so they're, uh, uh, so, so you basically can have three or four compressors at a station and you've got a multiple stations along a, a pipeline there. Uh, we do have a, uh, a uh, what we call BHE utility uh, uh, supplier system where we track uh, all the uh, power plants and all the compressor stations for BHE Energy, and they own two uh, two of the major pipelines and are a major producer in this area. Uh, so this is another uh, gas processing plant uh, a schematic uh, as to getting the acid gas removal and dehydration and uh, the um, gas liquids re uh, capture. So the liquefaction train, which is uh, with all these new LNG plants going in, has uh, obviously uh, huge amounts of uh, compression investment, as well as uh, uh, separation out of some of the uh, liquids, etc. So the um, producers are, are um, profiled in our oil and gas uh, refining markets and, and projects. And, uh, you know, the, the 10 largest here do have quite a, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of the total uh, uh, market. And what we're uh, essentially saying is that for the combust flow and treat companies, that by focusing on the, the 1,000 or 2,000 largest companies in oil and gas and all the other areas around the world, you can uh, address about 60 to 70 percent of the entire market and this would be for nozzles as well as for other uh, components and uh, we, we will not necessarily get this point going to the um, some of these here but what i would like to do then is go to the uh, go to the uh, process uh, sl slide so i'm going to get out of this set of slides here and I'm going to go to the one that's got the processes in it. And we'll open that one up. So these are the combust flow and treat options related to IIoT. So there's 5 billion devices. Uh, connected to the internet and the oil and gas industry is going to spend close to $50 billion a year by uh, 2020 uh, for IT. And uh, so the ex exploration of greenfield re-engineering strategies for production in brownfields necessitates the digitalization 
of the assets to effectively use IIoT. So implementing the right tools across an enterprise data platform can counteract suppressed commodity prices, sustain profitability, and reduce OPEX and cap OPEX and CAPEX as well, as well as maintaining safety and, and return on investment. So I think this is being done without IIoT to a great extent because uh, a lot of credit has to be given to the uh, shale oil and gas operators who have done a lot of things by increasing the laterals underground uh, and all these different technologies that have really reduced the cost of extraction of oil and gas. But nevertheless, IIoT uh, is going to help them do that more in the future by optimizing re-engineering and uh, through effective use of, of, of IIoT to access uh, quality controlled spatial and temporal data collection from sensors, automated and semi-automated ex exploration of aggregated data to enable data-driven workflows and then domain knowledge and subject matter experts to break down the traditional engineering silos. McIlvain is taking this a step farther with subject matter ultra experts and organized decision systems. Essentially what we're saying is if you take a subject matter expert and have him leading and being involved in a organized decision system, he can then become a subject matter ultra expert. So this is a never ending thing. You can't just be an expert and you're permanently the expert. You have to uh, uh, keep up to date with all the latest uh, developments. So there's a lot of uh, hype, uh, but the bottom line is that uh, the, it, there is a, a substantial ROI and the decision systems uh, which we're uh, creating are part of a five-step program which will help change mindsets and provide a, a clear path to maximum utilization of IIoT. And this is, this is described on our website. So let's get into process management. Uh, Accenture says, uh, you know, one in concept is Uber for the field. So this is an operating model to drive out inefficiencies in operational decision making. So drawing a, a parallel to, to Uber, the uh, multi-skilled technicians along with high-tech gadgetry are, are uh, supply points equivalent to drivers. And unmanned artificial intelligence center of the brain is an app that runs diagnostics or across wells, directs technicians or vendors to the wells, and ag aggregates uh, ratings feedback on service quality. There are four key elements, including a liquid workforce. So to address issues and work plans optimized across activities. And by the way, on this, we, um, we, I was a keynote speaker at uh, Dryscover Users Conference, and there were a number of presentations by NAES there and, um, and by Predix. Uh, that um, have been pardoned me by um, uh, other other um, suppliers there that showed that with the right IIoT you can move some of your key people among plants. So NACE and AES has several coal-fired power plants relatively close to each other, and with the OSI systems that they now have, with SMUE SMUEs and so forth. They're able to uh, separate operations and maintenance and have some of the uh, operating uh, uh, gurus and managers move back and forth between the uh, plants. So dynamic analytics, connected operations, smart equipment uh, are all part of the Uber of the field. And YPRO calls uh, their strategy agility and certainly in the Shale industry uh, agility is a central concept uh, because uh, of the many different operations, the changing technologies, and a number of different uh, reasons. So 
cloud-based software, you know, as a service is probably going to be the wave of the future in in, uh, in most industries and certainly in the shale industries. And uh, then the rejuvenated shale industry will leverage digital uh, and people like uh, White Pro are uh, certainly uh, touting and predicting uh, this. And basically, uh, uh, an end here is broken it down into the fact you have all this technology improvements with shale point 2.0, and then you have uh, all the uh, IIoT to combine with it. Another uh, operator uh, here, or, or supplier of the of the software process management systems, is OSI Soft, as has a predictive intelligence or PI system that is being pretty widely used. Uh, Shell, for instance, has an enterprise agreement with OSI Soft, and the uh, the, the, the system is being utilized. Uh, uh, in a number of uh, places because Shell currently monitors over 7.5 million instruments with the PI system and conducts approximately uh, 100,000 calculations per minute with data captured and shaped by the systems with in select business groups. The PI systems are also the data engine for 30,000 reports and 40,000 displays daily. But I'd like to stop for a minute and point out why the necessity of the subject matter ultra experts. Even though you're a subject matter expert on, let's let's say, valves for a particular application, if there are 30,000 reports and 40,000 displays daily being generated and 1,000 of those are on the valves, and this is just one company, there's going to be a tremendous amount of total cost of ownership data, which is being uh, generated about all these different uh, uh, valves. And you, uh, you can't just be a subject matter expert that's casually involved in all this. You've got to be a subject matter ultra expert to try to keep up with this wave of uh, flood of knowledge that's going to be uh, developed. So. Uh, OSI uh, is, a, is a major player here, and through training programs, uh, they, they work from purchasing on to down with their software, and it places a premium on creating a unified data infrastructure, which is accessible to authorized employees. And I would emphasize partners here, because we see the each of the combust flow and treat equipments, uh, for instance, whether it's nozzles that we used uh, maybe as, a, as an example here because Russ is on the, in the phone with us here. But if there is a problem that's relevant to the nozzles and the uh, tier of command can't solve the problem, if beat nozzle is also has access to the data and can be contacted and can instantly look at it and say, this is, uh, this is how we think our nozzle might be impacting this one way, way or another. So the um, I think the the whole um, idea of cloud-based software and access by uh, partners is very important. And another thing that OSI Soft uh, shows is that. There can be a short-term payback, but the real big value is, is over time. They're pretty much ensconced in a number of different uh, oil and gas companies. You can see uh, people with 55% of the global capacity are using the PI system. And if you're a vendor of combust flow and treat, and you can reach 55% of the production and 35% of the pipelines and 25% of the LNG uh, just through um, uh, understanding uh, the various uh, uh, nuances of one, one uh, software company. Uh, you can see our original point here of 
focusing on the top uh, thousand or two thousand uh, operators and understanding uh, the uh, how how they are uh, evaluating uh, products through their various process management software. Emphasis is uh, another uh, optimizer here with their software uh, addressing emerging uh, business challenges, and they offer visibility across the enterprise from the supply chain all the way uh, through, and they have what they call their centers of ex ex excellence in exploration, com production, pipeline management, and other areas here. The shale industry is interesting is in that these fracking trucks uh, from the production side are a major part of the way you get your um, wells drilled. And what they've done is put the components and the intelligence all on a truck here. And Futura is one software company. Uh, that provides uh, a, a Cerebra di diagnostics, prog prognost prognostics and diagnostics platform uh, that um, gets a ver signals from a variety of assets in the on the truck, such as the acidizing unit, fracking pumps, chemical additive units, blenders, generators, and then has the various uh, sensors, monitors that and can uh, predict failures and maintenance, spare part requirements, and uh, optimize asset performance and utilization. So monitoring and control is uh, a big uh, opportunity uh, and for the, ultimately for the industry to succeed, you know, you can't have big safety problems and you can't have big methane leaks and so forth. And it's interesting, here's two uh, papers that show the methane uh, emissions from coal and from uh, natural gas. Uh, one of them, which uh, takes into account the fugitive emissions, shows that uh, natural gas would be a, is a much bigger emitter of uh, methane. So there's all sorts of fugitive uh, emissions control requirements that are needed. And we just had a refineries uh, webinar. And for instance, in California, there's going to be 15 pollutants that have to be measured continuously from every uh, refinery. So valves and actuators are an important uh, part of this. Uh, valve uh, uh, linear position sensors are uh, used in hazardous locations and uh, do contribute. Uh, to the uh, proper functioning of the uh, up the valves, uh, Dan Voss uh, has pressure uh, uh, transmitters and temperature and so forth uh, for the, all the fracking trucks and other applications. They're they're also into some of these areas uh, with some of their equipment, as you can see, with blenders and uh, other key oil field services equipment. So the uh, here's an article by Emerson talking about uh, the fact for emergency shutdowns that um, that safety instrumented systems is a set of components with logic solvers and final control elements arranged for taking a process from a safe state uh, to a uh, to a safe safe state when predetermined conditions are tripped. So this, this is an important uh, component here, certainly for every one of the uh, of, of the systems. And Rotark makes the valve actuators uh, uh, with a reliable process control solution, eliminating venting and greenhouse gas emissions in, in compliance. Butterfly valves can be a cost-effective way to reduce the uh, fugitive emissions. And this is a presentation that's in our uh, 
uh, in the intelligence system uh, by uh, the crane uh, people. And pump controls are another uh, uh, opportunity here, which are demonstrated by the Bentec Pumpmaster RTU system. This leads to a point that uh, we're probing is what is the what we call edge computer technology? What is the opportunity for a pump manufacturer, for instance, to provide the edge computer technology that actually operates the pump? sends uh, remote monitoring signals to the cloud and receives them back again. But without that edge technology, there would just be a, a massive data going to the cloud and maybe not as sophisticated a data analytic system uh, to come back with the right answers. So when you can provide a, a local edge computing system such as this, uh, you can work uh, effectively with the cloud-based system and generate higher revenues than you than would be if you're just furnishing a pump. Emerson is in a good position to take all this to the next level because they have uh, equipment and systems uh, throughout the uh, whole, whole uh, set of processes in the shale gas. And as you can see uh, here, uh, they have, from prediction measurement to asset management, Emerson solutions uh, reduce risk, increase reliability, and improve operational performance. So they have measure and analyze you know, flow meters, online density and viscosity, flow assurance, uh, pressure, temperature instrumentation, analytical pH, and so forth, safety monitoring. And then final uh, controls. So here's an example, for instance, uh, with uh, gas containing H2S in an Eagle Ford shale operation. And they were using uh, gas to um, power the valve that would uh, shut, the, uh, shut the, the, the gas flow out in case of an emergency which would be particularly critical with the H2S, but um, uh, they can no longer do that because of the H2S. Uh, doing it manually obviously would not work. And so they have a battery powered electrohydraulic uh, system, uh, which is uh, powered from solar and uh, has uh, solved the problem. So on the pumps and trucks, uh, here are just a few examples uh, of some of the critical components in the uh, fracking uh, production. And somebody like uh, Dragon Products is an example of all the novel and new technology which is cutting the cost of uh, fracking. So instead of a, a, a fracking sand truck, which is critical, you know, 30% of all what goes down the uh, well, in the fracking operation is uh, the sand, but rather than have pneumatic uh, trucks uh, using a pneumatic system to unload the truck and spend a lot of time either waiting or unloading, uh, Dragon Products has a uh, roll-off sand pod. So instead of, instead of the costly waiting time, you just drop the pod on site and then pick up the uh, empty so these are the kind of things that are cutting the cost and will continue to do so and do need to be taken into account for all the monitoring and uh, um, fl flow devices. And okay, now you've got to deal with a flow device from a pod rather than from a pneumatic, pneumatic conveying from the truck. There, the, the fracking pumps uh, have wear parts that maybe only last weeks. Uh, so you've got a, a big market and you're dealing with relatively large flows, very high pressures, high abrasion, et cetera, et cetera. And so, for instance, Gardner Denver has a, a range of five different pumps for all this. Uh, we're uh, and Rolls-Royce have combined for the engine and the pumps. And they have the Epix uh, system. They've uh, proven that... Um, the maintenance characteristics on that uh, 
are attractive and are now marking that as a, a collaboration among the two companies. We track uh, in every different industry, uh, the guide control, liquids measurement, air and gas measurement, and free-flowing uh, powders. And this, this year in the U.S. alone, and, uh, the guide for oil and gas, which would be your process management systems and your uh, subject matter experts, would be a $2.2 billion market. But it's growing, uh, and by 2022, it'll be a $3.3 billion market. So, so it's actually growing faster than the control market, which is bigger and will be a, a $6.8 billion market in 2022. Uh, the liquids measurement uh, uh, will be a $1.4 billion market. Measuring air and gases, uh, another $1.4 and the free-flowing powders, uh, three, 309 million. So that, uh, I believe, ends this set of slides. What I'd like to do next is to go on to um, the uh, couple of the, just briefly show you a couple of the services that were involved in here. Um, here's the oil, gas, and uh, refining. And uh, I'm going to click on the operator flow profiles. We also have supplier profiles, and then we have forecasts for all these different uh, things. But the operator profiles, when we go down to, I think we'll just go down to Exxon Mobil. We're adding a, all the shale uh, companies in uh, over the next day or two. But what we're trying to do is to back up our, our forecast of what Exxon Mobil is going to buy with more details of the 37 refineries and in all the different things that they're doing in uh, shale. And what their plans are, uh, the, uh, if you go on here, you see, uh, the, the, of course, their financial strength, and, but the capital discipline, they have a number of uh, projects as, as of their 2017 uh, CapEx plan. So you can see they've got short cycle and, and longer term huge uh, investments. That they've that they've got here, and um, so they keep uh, expanding their their portfolio, and they basically, as you can see, production in a, in a lot of different areas here, and I just will go on to the Permian uh, Basin activities, but you can see in the Permian Basin uh, is a major activity uh, for there, and here's their strategic uh, uh, position here. So they've had some acquisitions, and they're moving forward on that. So anyway, we have uh, that uh, type of information there. And the um, the system does include uh, a number of things, including uh, market forecasts, and, and uh, includes a whole uh, a sophisticated uh, intelligence system here. So for instance, if you can click just on the most recent additions and you can see just in the last few days we've uh, added a number of uh, presentations by uh, OSI uh, soft and then you can link on these to the full uh, articles uh, so then you can uh, actually go into uh, everything this, this is a way of looking at everything that's been added recently alternatively if you wanted to for instance just go into Exxon Mobil uh, then you would go in under corporations and you would go in under E, and you would go in under uh, Exxon Mobil here, and uh, lots of people in the in the. Um, let's see, I guess Exxon Mobil. What am I looking at? Maybe I hit the wrong wrong key here. Or, See, uh, but in any case, there's all sorts of information on Exxon Mobil there. Let me just try that uh, uh, one more time, and then uh, uh, see here. Hmm. I'm 
So I did something wrong here, but anyway, we do have uh, information here. It's further down. Pardon? It would be further down as al alphabetical. Okay, that's good. good question. Yeah, maybe I just didn't go far enough, right? Uh, no. Uh, yeah. Okay, there we go. Thanks for the for the input there. Didn't look that closely. So uh, so we go to, to Exxon uh, Mobile here, and uh, so again, uh, the, what they're doing, they're expanding here. They're doing this. They've got something in Guyana. Uh, the uh, Petronas State. You know, consortium, uh, Greek offshore fields. So this is stuff that we're putting in there and continue to put in, and then you can go to all the uh, the details. So I think that uh, shows you what we're doing in that particular service. And uh, then uh, the uh, Industrial Internet of Things, uh, this presentation and the uh, uh, recording as well as the PowerPoints will all show up in this industrial uh, uh, Internet of Things, uh, the industrial IoT and remote O&M uh, report. And this gets into every different industry. We have forecasts like we were showing you before for guide control and three types of uh, measurement in uh, each of the uh, uh, for each industry uh, for the next five or six years. So there's 20 or 30,000 uh, forecasts there. Uh, we also have a forecast uh, for those uh, uh, opportunities for each of the uh, 500 largest uh, purchasers of uh, IIoT and remote O&M uh, services and products. And again, we have an intelligence system there uh, and directories with uh, the various vendors. Uh, we have a monitoring directory and another one on information technology uh, related uh, things, the forecasting, etc. And then we get into uh, uh, newsletters and and abstracts. Uh, so you can look at the newsletters going all the way back. Here's January and and December. And uh, so uh, we just did this refinery webinar and we are we actually even have now one of our decision systems on uh, refineries uh, uh, for the refinery industry it's a whole website and one of the sub uh, categories is the um, uh, fugitive emissions and solving those problems and there is a a lot of activity there because of uh, national regulations to uh, measure benzene at the fence line for every refinery in the country and then all the uh, California refineries have to measure uh, 15 different uh, pollutants come uh, 2020. So the, this is a uh, uh, monthly newsletter that that goes uh, along with it and uh, so this is, is, is the package that uh, is available around shale and the other services. That ends the uh, presentation uh, for today. Did anybody have any uh, comments or questions? Uh, we certainly got time for that if someone does. I did want to go back to the subject matter expert where you gave the nozzle example and there was like 40, 30 to 40,000 different reports or something. Will the software be able to drill down to the specific portion of those reports that deals with the process where, um, say, for, for example, my nozzle might be used that would be given to us or that we could access? Right. Uh, in one of our uh, uh, webinars a few uh, months or so ago, uh, for instance, I've forgotten which industry it was, we were, um, I, I believe, believe it was a spraying systems uh, um display there that showed the, the pretty much edge computers for pulp and paper industry, I think it was, where people like yourself in spraying systems have the opportunity for the humidification requirements in a pulp and paper plant to provide a whole edge computing system where you're delivering the right amount of, uh, of spray through a, a multiple different nozzles uh, as needed. And uh, 
So the um, that can all be uh, accomplished with the uh, edge computing delivered by the nozzle manufacturer and greatly in increase your revenues. But maybe I didn't quite understand your uh, uh, question. Maybe you'd like to re repeat that again, uh, Russ. You were talking about how uh, there was uh, constant reporting, so that there was like thirty to forty thousand data streams or something like that. That uh, oh yes, right, right, yeah, so, yeah. That was what we were pointing out is that things like the nozzles will be monitored, uh, and the process is certainly. So somebody like yourself who's a, a nozzle manufacturer, there'll be somebody, for instance, at BASF that's watching the performance of all the nozzles in the system and also how often they have to be maintained or repaired. So it's not only performance, but also maintenance. And what I think you're going to find is the plants are no longer going to be buying most of the nozzles because there's somebody back at corporate that's watching the performance of all those nozzles and and uh, you know the flow jet and all these other different uh, uh, world jet and all these different uh, designs and and that and seeing where their problems and um, the um, and uh, for instance this uh, this DSS DSUA um, webinar, uh, webinar for a conference that I went to was a keynote speaker. They had uh, a big problem because in a dry scrubber system, you got to get just the right humidification, you know, of your sorbent going in in order to, uh, uh, on one hand, not uh, blind your bags, and on the other hand, you know, right. maximize your efficiency. So the, um, the the OSI software, not by itself, but with the uh, Primex uh, support is actually making changes to uh, some of the components uh, in order to improve that uh, humidification and and distribution of the uh, uh, slurry. And so, um, so I think you use. I guess the point being, you use these this tremendous amount of data uh, analytics to um, see what the problems are. But then, uh, then you really need the subject matter ultra experts to. Uh, uh, solve those problems and for someone like yourself who's a nozzle manufacturer and has the opportunity to see where the problems are and maybe you've got a better design nozzle to solve those problems or you maybe even have to develop something but uh, so we do think that is going to create a, a great opportunity for those creative and innovative uh, component suppliers who uh, can provide a lower total cost of ownership option. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, if there are no other questions, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. This will be recorded. And uh, the, the recording actually will be up on YouTube. The PowerPoints themselves will uh, not be available except for subscribers. But thanks, everybody. And uh, this is Bob McElvain signing off for today.